Hello and welcome back and that is right today we are looking at this this is the Ugreen DXP4800 Plus, otherwise known as the Ugreen NAS Sync Series. This is one of several devices that Ugreen are planning to launch on the market via crowdfunding. This is the 4Bay model. This is the 4Bay Pentium 10GBE equipped model as well. And in today's video, we're going to take a real close look at the hardware. We're going to look at the hardware specifications inside and out and also dig into the back end just a wee bit. But before we get into that, quick few disclaimers straight out the gate number one this is a product that's going through crowdfunding this has been supplied to the channel here by you green in order for us to basically get our thoughts on it share it with you guys there but this isn't like going to amazon and just putting your card details in and getting yourself something through the post this is going through crowdfunding so to buy this right now, and there will be a link in the description that will take you to Ugreen's website and their crowdfunding, you've got to keep in mind that as it stands, the only way to get entry to this at launch is via crowdfunding, which is not without an element of risk. So do keep that in mind. Second, do keep in mind when you're looking at this device here on the table is right now I'm recording this on the 1st of March 2024. But this isn't launching on crowdfunding until about two or three weeks from now. And only that, when you do get this device, it'll be even further than that. So as much as I'm reviewing this product, we have to keep in mind the development will change. Not only on a software level, but on a hardware level. And what we're seeing today is representative of this unit. So hopefully any negatives that we come across and I share with you guys in the video, fingers crossed these things can get changed later on. Who knows? That's one of the other benefits of crowdfunding. But of course, the other benefits of crowdfunding for anyone that's ever engaged in that side of things is, of course, the pricing. A lot of the time you can get in on the ground on a lot of these things and save a bit of bunt. So right now, you Green are stating that the RRP recommended retail price of this product is going to be $699. But via crowdfunding and notwithstanding, they've got a 40% off deposit system again that'll be linked in the description i'm sure but at the moment via cr uh, crowdfunding and kickstarter they're stating this device the pentium model will roll out the gate of 419 dollars to those early backers so there are you know pros and cons to crowdfunding and i know a lot of brands do utilize crowdfunding to launch their first products you don't have a big enough name in the world and they use a lot of the global tools accessible to them to be able to reach a larger audience as effectively as possible but ugreen is a brand that's been around they are known in the it world and they're not just launching one product either they are launching an entire range a two a four a six and eight and even a uh, bay model and a flash model as well this is a huge move by the brand which again i find very strange is going via the doorway of crowdfunding. Before we go on to the design of this thing, and we'll be talking a lot more about the design of it shortly, let's talk a little bit about what you get for your money. So inside the snazzy little retail box, and I'll be straight with you, it's actually quite nice. Inside we've got our accessories kit. What do we get for our money? I will say straight away, this is one of the nicest presentations of a NAS I've had on the channel for a while. Notwithstanding the Cat 7, um, gold tipped cables there for our ethernet cables and again we've got two of them very thick high quality ethernet cables in you've got your screwdriver and screws for the 2.5 inch media this system has four SATA bays and two m.2 nvme bays which are reported by ugreen to be gen 4 times 4 speed which will be very interesting to see with no downgrades a couple of the thickest m2 nvme heat pads i've ever seen you've got your warranty information the system arrives with two years of manufacturer's warranty and i will say it's actually quite a nice manual yes it's bilingual there's lots of different languages so it works out maybe about five or six languages in there but fair play given all of that area is in english it's actually quite nice a decent amount of information and very rare to see a paper manual but the thing i find kind of weird uh, and again this will make more sense when you see the similar video to this involving the flash system this arrives with this big old external power brick here, which when we have a closer look is a 150 watt external power brick. Why isn't it a Ugreen PSU? Ugreen produce their own power suppliers. They're really well known for it. And although the flash smaller system I'll show on the channel soon has got its own Ugreen PSU, this doesn't. And I'm sure this is a very, very good you know, PSU and we'll have this one where it's just up and running. But you didn't come to this video to hear about accessory kits. You wanted to know about the bloody NAS. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk design. Straight away, I could show this more to the camera here, but as you probably already worked out, we've got this lovely close-up camera here that we're gonna be utilizing throughout the course of this video. Now, given this is a big metallic box, and this is just a big metallic box that arguably is in a sea of other big metallic boxes in the market, fair play to them. They have gone and made this quite unique. That nice, bold, almost fallout vault level uh, text there on the front. Each one of those bays being lockable, I might add as well. Also along the bottom there, let's not overlook it. Not only have we got a couple of USB ports, and again, those are 10 gig USBs. Those USBs there in type A and type C, lovely stuff there on the front, but also an SD card slot. Now I'm gonna say right now, why is it so tough these days to have an SD card slot? And I'm sure someone in the description is gonna tell me because it's to do with lane allocation and wasting of that lane allocation. But if you go back a decade in the world of NAS, going back to your Synology DS214s and the like, these are, you know, 2013, 14 systems. They were the last systems to rock out the gate with SD card slots. Now, photo and video editors are always requiring that. They need it for docking stations, which again, brands like Synology have started elbowing and supporting via USB and getting rid. But on top of that, just having standard SD card injection it's actually surprisingly useful and it kind of blows my mind that I now, in 2024, I've got to talk about a crowdfunded NAS from some brand's entry product and say how good it is that an SD card slot in 2024. But um, moving forward, we can talk about the outside. The outside is completely metal all the way around and again there is no ventilation on the top it's relying purely on horizontal ventilation throughout the whole thing some very brief noise testing on this device we had a decibel meter via a phone connected via a bluetooth mic so there's an ever so slight fraction there uh, between the noise and what's being reported there fraction of a second but uh, initially let's listen to the idle noise of this system while no activity is happening And now let's listen to the device while we've got all four drives being active while I transferred a large pile of data between folders on the system, you know, pushing some read-write activity on those hard drives and facilitating the fan perhaps kicking in. Let's listen to the system in active. So noise level wise, not too bad. I'll be honest, obviously using a microphone and a YouTube uh, clip here is gonna enhance noise ever so slightly, but I'm quite actually kind of pleased with what I'm seeing here in terms of audio levels there. Considering this is a metal chassis that's being utilized for heat dissipation throughout, I'm not too browned off by the noises I was hearing there. And particularly because I was using enterprise class drives there at 10 TB, we have to also acknowledge that the drive noise was forming a decent whack of the ambient noise of the system when in operation. Let's head back to the studio. On the base of the system, we've got this pad here, and this is where our memory modules and the um, M.2 NVMe modules are located there at the base. If we look at the rear of it, one of the other little design choices I like, because again, as mentioned, it's using horizontal ventilation, but I like this. Now again, much like the SD card slot, giving them tremendous praise for a vent panel on their fans that's magnetic, Gaming rigs and normal bog standard pieces have had that for years, but it's the idea that none of these guys over here these days in 2024 are arriving with these very very small quality of life improvements and i really really like that so we'll get on to the main ports there on the back in just a moment but for all of my heavy praise i want to talk about something on this box that i'm not actually that pleased about and that is the trays now let's you know start positive they're nice enough trays if i bring that there to camera there they're nice big bulky trays they don't require a screwdriver 
they go straight in, the click and load drives there inside and spring loaded there at the top and the trays themselves do have a locking mechanism included there. So lovely stuff. The one I'm not overly keen on is the one they feel very plasticky. They do not feel particularly sturdy. And when I try to remove and insert our drive, it's done via this outside system here where we take our drives. These are one of the four WD Red 8TB Pros that we're going to be utilizing uh, in future testing with this system. You align it with the holes on the side and you push in that panel there. It just doesn't feel very secure. Now, it holds the drive in. The drive's held. It's absolutely fine there. But the tray itself, for all of its good looks, and I like the bold fonts that are being utilized on this, it just, it, it doesn't feel very sturdy, this tray. And I know that's a very minor problem, and you have a lot of users that are, you know, never going to be hot swapping drives too much in the future anyway. But still, nonetheless, I'm kind of surprised that the trays themselves feel as flimsy as that, when the rest of the system genuinely feels remarkably sturdy all the way through and i like again the ventilation there is going to work all the way through so if we remove each of those individual trays pop those out and take a good look inside i'm hoping the light will allow us to see more there but you can see inside there the rear of the system we've got that big rear mounted fan just a single rear mounted fan but overall i'm really pleased with this this feels sturdy it feels very well put together i will say as well and overall with the exception of my niggling complaints i have about these trays overall i'm really really impressed about that physical design now when we're accessing that rear panel there we can talk more about that storage the system rocks out the gate, by the way, with traditional RAID compatibility there. So unlike a few systems uh, we've talked about recently that do not have RAID out the gate, we're of course talking about the Zimmer Cube that arrived with the in-development Zimmer OS, uh, which has just rolled in uh, RAID support, I should add. Uh, this does arrive with a lot of those features straight away already ready. Now, this video is not going to include much on the software. I've already kind of alluded to that in other, uh, other areas because the software is still very much uh, mid-alpha beta at the moment. And although the mobile app will be launching very, very soon, the actual graphical user interface via the web browser is not really quite there. And although I've utilized it, it could still do a lot more work. So you'll see it a little bit more in the, later in the video. We can see there what's going on inside. We've got this nice Ugreen branded panel there. And again, presumably this is a, um, a sister board there that's a uh, sister board for the main storage drives going into the back. But... At the bottom there, we have got that 8 gig of DDR5 memory there. Now, that 8 gig of DDR5 memory is combined with that Intel uh, Pentium inside, which supports up to 64 gig of DDR5 memory there. I'm not seeing any support of ECC. There's the usual on die stuff. Um, but what's really intriguing is our two M.2 NVMe slots here. Now, those two M.2 slots, let's angle that there for us. Those two M.2 slots... They are Gen 4 times 4. That means each one of them has theoretically the bandwidth to saturate 8,000 megabytes per second realistically. When we're looking at Gen 4 drives on the market, the ones we're going to be testing later on inside this system are an AdLink 8TB, because I want to know if this system supports 8TB Gen 4 drives. I'm also going to be utilizing uh, Seagate Fire CUDA, uh, a 530 drive. That's a Gen 4 times 4 drive, capable of hitting 7,300 megabytes per second, according to Seagate themselves. Obviously, block sizes are going to make a big difference there. What I'm going to be really interested in seeing is what's going to happen with this system, and we've got it connected up, and we populated it with hard drives and SSDs. I want to see, one, whether those individual drives are going to actually hit that performance number. Now, um, and two, I want to figure out if, when we're utilizing those NVMEs, to what extent can we use them? Now, with that first point, those of you that have been following coverage of other products recently, such as that Zimmer Cube I mentioned, uh, there was a video over on Hardware Haven. I recommend it. Again, I'll try and link to it in the description. If I don't, remind me and I'll add it um, as a comment or in the description, talking about how a lot of these systems are utilizing those little uh, switch components, AS media components and more. Uh, channeling for a lot of the PCIe traffic and in that case of the Zimmer Cube, one of the earliest releases of their hardware was actually bottlenecking a lot of the individual uh, components that although in of themselves were say for example Gen 3 times 4 because they were being funneled by this particular PCIe switch they were having dropped performance this is a lot of storage here and there's only four SATA drives so we're not too worried about that 
but for two M uh, M.2 Gen 4 times 4 slots with this system already arriving with um, 10 GPE connectivity on the rear, more on that later, I'm going to be very interested to see. I'm going to be very, very um, um, observatory about those individual Gen 4 slots there. But overall, in terms of design, I really like it. And as mentioned earlier on, when we remove this panel, there's going to be some users wondering about heat dissipation of those M.2s. That's why we've got these, frankly, enormous M.2 heat panels to fill that void. Why is that? Because when we do put in our M.2s inside this rig, this heat panel actually acts as our heat dissipation. This entire casing is our heat dissipation with that heat pad doing all of the job to communicate that heat from the drive and its components into the dissipating heat of the casing there. So that's a nice little design pick. It's not new, they didn't reinvent the wheel here by doing that, but I will say overall, I'm really pleased with the design of this. Let's talk about ports and connectivity. Now the ports and connectivity on this device, again, for its price point, when you're looking at that early Kickstarter launch price of $419, are actually pretty impressive when you compare it against the majority of other devices in the market these days. To put that into perspective, uh, when you're looking at systems right now, and even if we go with the RRP of $699 uh, that you Green are stating for this device when it hits full normal retail, uh, for $699 you're getting a four bay device that not only features 10 GBE, so 10 gigabytes Ethernet out the gate, but it's also got an additional failover of 2.5 GBE. So you've got one that you can utilize for your standard editing and your high density workflow, and you've got an additional 2.5 gigabit network port there that's going to be utilized for the general shared network all rolled in. Alongside that, we've got a couple of USB Type 2 ports there. Now, I've already delved lightly into the software utilizing the DXP480T and I'll say right now I didn't really see any KVM stuff there so I'm curious what these USB ports are going to be used for perhaps a UPS battery there was support of an uninterruptible power supply uh, supplier um, integration into the software but alongside that we've got another USB port there of uh, connectivity I believe that one might be our 5 gig USB port I'll have to double check there I know uh, the front ones uh, are slightly different to the back and of course we've got an HDMI output there which is a an HDMI 2.0 I believe or 2.0 I there is talk about some of the higher dense uh, more powerful systems supporting 8k multimedia I think this is the 4k model and of course we've got the barrel there for that external PSU that we've already talked about there Likewise, when it came to power consumption on this device, I do think there is room for improvement. It's not terrible, and my methodology with regards to testing the power consumption wasn't exactly what you would call cutting edge. But nonetheless, even while uh, the initial boot of this device did result in a high peak which came down the power consumption i think does leave a little bit of room to improve there and again how much of that is to do with the optimization there in the background by ugreen and how much of it is to do with the base level hardware again we'll have to find out more as later development on this device happens remember this isn't the device that a lot of you are probably going to be getting if you do go ahead and back this crowdfunding uh, moving away from the idle power consumption after the boot after a few minutes i went into an active process where i was getting the drive to sort of ramp up and do some defrag and the power consumption went up a little bit there but not too much overall i'd say the power consumption still isn't terrible but it still could be better so in terms of connectivity once you combine those rear ports with those front mounted ports we've already talked about the leds as well uh, for a little bit of indication no lcd panel I'm kind of pleased with what we're seeing. At 699, um, once you also factor in the Pentium internal hardware that we'll talk about in just a moment, I tell you overall, I'm quite pleased in terms of ports connectivity about what we're getting here for that price. Again, we are still talking about crowdfunding. We've got to be playing fair about this. This is not your standard retail product. We have to look at it in that fashion. Nevertheless, we are still talking about a fairly well-established brand right now that's putting a lot of their reputation and weight behind this. And... At 419 or 699, you'd be very hard pushed to get better hardware than this um, externally and internally right now at the start of 2024. Have you ever heard that expression, it's what's on the inside that matters? Well, let's find out. Okay, so we've got most of the external chassis out of the way. Let's make our way over to our big camera once again. There's the board from earlier. And straight away, we can see there at the bottom, 
that is our OS disk for us to play with there. Now, taking a closer look at that drive, we got ourselves a Fizon E. 13t so that's an e13 fison ssd i presume that's a gen 3 drive as well and looking at the hardware architecture this is anything like uh, the dxp 4480t uh, then that is going to be a gen 3 times 2 drive something we'll find out more when we deep dive a little further now if we look we can just make out underneath a large fan assisted heatsink that houses our PSU, I'm uh, sorry, our CPU even, I apologize. So for now, let's get this off of this board and take a closer look at that motherboard, shall we? So straight away, it is an Intel Pentium Gold 8505. Now that is a Gen 4 architecture CPU that also features, impressively, 20 lanes uh, to play with throughout the rest of this system hardware there. So there's a lot to be getting on with. And when you look at some of the higher density i5 models that are flying around, they are 20 lane CPUs as well, which is quite impressive as well that this Pentium has at least got that backbone with us to work with. Um, now it's a five core CPU, something I find very, very bizarre, I might add, because I don't think I've ever had a five core CPU. Also on top of that, it is a six thread CPU. So um, of those cores, by the way, that's one power for efficiency. And looking at my notes, it is a um, 4.4 gigahertz CPU when needed. It also arrives with 1.1 gigahertz of integrated graphics as well. So again, that's your Intel graphics. And we've got that disconnected there. So let's see if we can slide this off. Aha, it's always the super secret fifth screw that you can never see until the end. So we can take a good long look at this MOBO, more to that in just a moment. Straight away, while I was dismantling it, a few things I noticed as well, and I'll bring this closer to this camera here. Can you make that out there? It is a U-Green stamped controller there for the SATA board there. Again, the only reason I bring this out is we've talked about a lot of um, mid-range turnkey solutions in the last 12 months trying to compete with the likes of QNAP Synology and the rest that are rolling out their own solutions but generally aping and reutilizing top 10 and cwwk and the like for a lot of their hardware architecture a lot of this is first party branded i've got to say again all of my negative remarks about the psu earlier aside i really like the production and the build quality of this thing it has been exceptionally well put together and i would argue comparable to the likes of synology and qnap i'm just going to pop the cage to one side because let's face it what you came for now is that main controller board. Let's get that nice and big there for you guys. There on the rest of the board, we've got the connector that the SATA sister board is going directly into. Again, highly comparable to likes of Synology and QNAP there. A good arrangement of chips and boards here. I'm going to have to do a little bit of closer investigation, I might add, to try and see about some of these network components. So what I'm going to be doing is breaking down in an article below rather than wasting a lot of your time reading through each of these individual components and chips. But what I'll do is take lots of photos of this afterwards and feed this into an article on NAS Compares below. And then we can sort of go back and forth about some of these chips and their components. But overall, this is a very, very cleanly put together device. And I'm sure there is at least one um, uh, PCIe switch component here on board, but I'll be buggered if I can see it on there, which is actually quite an interesting and hopefully, fingers crossed, pleasing sign that this device is going to be utilizing true PCIe bandwidth of those 20 lanes all the way through this system. What I'm going to do is get this device put back together and get it set, sorted out with our storage drives and take a little bit of a dive into the hardware there, shall we? So moving over to the software of the DXP4800, we've got to keep in mind that this is, of course, a beta. Currently, this is going to be looking at version 1.000483 of the UGOS or UGreen operating system for NAS here on this system. I am working on, in the background, a full dedicated video just on the software, deep diving on the whole thing. Alongside that, uh, about a four, four and a half thousand word article going through all of the features, what I liked and what I didn't like about the software, hopefully coming very, very soon. But for now, we're just going to kind of skim over a lot of this beta software and once again talk about what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, I will say that the client application that you can get uh, to find the device on your local area network, whether it is you're going to be utilizing standard LAN connectivity or connecting with a Ugreen account for remote activity, um, I'm focusing mainly on the LAN. This is still a beta and I will go into some of the security stuff later on. But 
It seems reasonable enough. For example, here is that DXB 4800 there. You've got to add the login credentials, as you can see here for our demo unit. But what it produces now is a kind of portal non-browser uh, version window of it. It's not really a synchronized client I'd like to see comparable uh, to that of Synology Drive or QNAP QSync. It does give you access without a web browser, but that's really it. I'm not sure what I would use this for. It's not bad. It's just not quite sure what this is giving me that the web browser isn't. But carrying on with the web browser there, we can have a little look at our GUI. It's all fairly clear. We've got information there with our task manager running there in the background, top right, more information about our user account. Kind of annoyed that currently, at least in this beta right now, there isn't two-factor or a you know, 2FA or OTP services right now. It's all fairly standard stuff. The fundamental building blocks are there, and you're going to keep hearing me saying that throughout this section of the video but ultimately i do think this does still feel like a beta a lot of the structure is there i like what i'm seeing i like you know the notification service there. i like the file manager i like the layout of things i'm not overly keen on this font but apart from that i'm liking what i'm seeing here um if we make our way into the storage manager for example there's the layout of all of our data disks there we've got the main hard drives and the m2 nvme base there we've also got this really nice widget system as well i quite like that where, for example, let's get some volume status information there, and it'll just add all of these widgets as we need them. We can add them all the way along, as many as we like, telling us more storage information about the system. Everything feels pretty intuitive. We've got the support of rate configurations there. We can break it down into multiple storage pools, storage volumes. We'll make our way over to the other U Green NAS here. I can show you just how easy it is to build up storage. So, for example, we can go ahead with this A4 M2 NVMe system, pop in a RAID 5 there, select which drives you want to put inside, whether you want to test the drives in advance. So, let's select those three. The other one I removed for testing. And you can see you can go ahead, create that storage area, create volume, choose whether you want to use BTRF or ext4 pretty much everything you're going to expect there it's all fairly standard stuff um, and again when you go to the individual drives you can go ahead and perform tests here so for example we can look at the details of individual drives run performance tests on some of those drives i'll be retesting these later on again don't worry too much about these performance numbers here at the bottom that was an earlier version of the os and it does look like there's been improvements i won't say Full improvement, but there's definitely improvements over what I saw previously there. Drive management is all pretty much what you would expect. You can run operational routines to sort of test, find out the health of your drives over time. And you can set these on a schedule or just ad hoc if you need them. And that extends, by the way, all the way down to if you want to sort of look at the health of your storage areas, whether you want to take advantage of SSD caching or adding hot spares to your storage. Again, breaking into the volumes as well, we can find out more about it. But... From what I was going through all the stuff uh, to do with creating shared folders that I'll go through in a moment, alongside creating those storage pools and volume, couldn't find any option currently for things like write once, read many, or encrypted volumes, something I would have liked to have seen. All of the fundamentals, again, the basics are there, but... I think right now this software just feels like there's a few bells and whistles missing from it early doors. So, for example, here in the file manager, there are some things that I really, really like. For example, the file deduplication um, area here, which allows you to manually select areas of storage on the system and then run a check to see if there's duplicated files in those areas so unlike an automated back end duplication this is one that we can push through manually creating shared folders incredibly straightforward all the options that i want to see are there so we can go ahead create them nice and easy say who can access them say who can't access them access them go ahead create them nice and straightforward it's that easy to do it with all of this being managed by user management there in the control panel it all looks let's argue quite similar to what we found from other brands for good or for bad call it inspiration call it copy and call it what you will all the options are there i just wish they went a little further where they went ahead and included that two-factor authentication i went wish they went ahead with the worm went ahead with a file encrypt uh, uh, folder encryption as well um i will highlight as well i should have touched on this earlier on in the storage manager there are other kind of global options built into the storage area which when it comes to raid at least that other brands have embraced or are yet to embrace such as the quick repair option that allows the raid to be rebuilt very very quickly only 
building the areas of the drive where data would have resided in a RAID rebuild and then zeroing out the rest of the disks. Same goes with the priority of the RAID. All of these are things we find in other NAS brands and it's nice to see them here but then it just kind of annoys me when those glaring emissions pop up from time to time as well. Now connecting external drives as you can see from this peripheral drive here everything appears automatically and i'm pleased to say that you know standard copy and paste operations everything you would expect from a fully functioning file manager are all present here so for example if we go ahead and copy this file here we've got all of the context options it's stylized a little bit i would argue on windows 11 uh, logic we can go ahead create a share for that file with all the usual um settings there for expiration password protection download limits that's all kind of lovely and peaceful and lovely what i want to see if we go ahead and copy this file here so we select the copy option one of the things i'm less keen on i would argue is when i do want to perform uh, a copy action so if we go into our shared folders here select ourselves that new test folder we created and paste that data into there we can hear it kicking off in the system but it's, i have to go into the task center to see that copy file um, action happened there was no notification here so i would have kind of liked to have seen that pop up automatically or at least it show me that was happening because if that had been a larger file process i wouldn't have known that was happening again this is a beta so i have to hold off a lot of those true judgments there when it comes to accessing files, some multimedia files are still accessible via this user interface here. So for example, if I try and play some files here and we go into some of these test files and we go into play ourselves a nice straightforward file. So for this, for example, we'll go for an H264 MKV file. Let's play that, double click. It does open up in the window right here to allow us to play the file within the context of the browser menu. We can even change some of the file there to a lower picture quality there standard options all of that all built in there isn't a application for playing videos such as you would compare to Synology video station there is a photo application and there is a DLNA media server application going it will go into more detail uh, during the software video but when it comes to transcoding and playing back a, a more complex files there and we play back this HEVC file here we are we are able to utilize some of the system's hardware resources to convert that file as you can see they're on screen with the cpu utilization but still nonetheless there isn't really direct control of this right now in the native application hopefully this is something that will improve later photos on the system are again openable via the file manager there so if i go ahead and select ourselves a nice straightforward photo here and we double click that it opens up nice and easy and if we right click to find out more properties and information there we can find out a little bit more we can share the file if we choose understandably the standard rules and rights apply for us to do the uh, limitations as before but if we go to the photo application it's got that ai photo recognition there and it just needs a lot more work in the presentation of a lot of these options i've mentioned it already with the fonts but i would say although all of the fundamentals are there and again we've got the timeline there on the right hand side we can create our smart albums utilizing the filtered metadata being scraped from a lot of those photos and that extends all the way to facial recognition there so for example if we find this person here this is jason boom we've got jason there now named in our list of people uh, recognized with the ai photo recognition but utilizing that data and using the search functionality alongside these still feels a little bit more limited there that said utilizing the places and the scraping of the metadata for uh, location data i actually quite like it kind of annoys me it starts off on china straight away and i would have liked to just immediately zoom in on where the majority of photos are taken but i do quite like this map mode again not unusual it has been found in other nas brands as well but i like this is all built in here that allows me to see a lot more like geolocational information about where those images are being taken the tools and services still need to be fleshed out a little bit so for example if you want to give remote access to friends to upload their images onto your device and the share uh, you know when you're creating shares to these images you can manage it there along with that um, removement of duplications as mentioned earlier on but where i think there is definitely a real nice feature built in here is when we go into the settings and we go into some of those ai settings because there's actually quite a decent amount of um uh, models for ai built into this system there is the usual facial recognition and object recognition that's provided by other nas brands but there's other ones in there even integration and presumably in beta of pet recognition something i've seen 
on some edge surveillance technology that I talked about on the channel before. Same thing with OCR as well. So if you find an image that's got text in it, so let's find ourselves one down here. And we've got uh, some of that um, uh, thumbnail generation happening there in the background. If I select, for example, this image here and we use our text generation, we can see that it is utilized the scanning there and it's there on that board game for Home Alone. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. Home Alone, the board game. Zoom out there because we've accidentally gone in. And we use the OCR reader. It has seemingly found the majority of it. This isn't a great example because it's using cursive writing. But at the very least, it was still able to find and use that OCR reader to garner that information. Now, when it comes to uh, finding out a lot more of the metadata on these images, and we will need, we'll need to find ourselves a much larger image there, I'm pleased to confirm that you can go in and get some of that metadata there that's been scraped with regards to the aperture, the ISO, all the stuff to do with those images there. Moreover, if you want to go ahead into Folder View, I'm pleased to confirm that you can use Folder View rather than utilizing that big control deck there and that large sprawling show. Again, nice stuff. One of the things I don't like, however, though, and again, this is something we've criticized Synology for in the past, is the default media location. There is no means here to change this. And even though I went through the control panel to define and find out more about changing the indexing and find out exactly how I could change that, I couldn't find any option to change where those uh, directories for photos were being kept from. I can understand with so many different AI models being built into that photo manager, they probably want to use default storage locations for photos, but it's just kind of annoying that I need to store photos in that personal folder photo location when there's every possibility that I want to be utilizing my own directories, particularly for shared folders and multimedia. Searching the system can be conducted easily here from the top. So for example, if we do a very quick check, we're able to search for files by that file name, and then you can actually expand into the universal search to find out more. And again, that can be extended across the whole system, but of course it will depend on the kind of file you are finding there. But you can cut through and that universal search is pretty darn responsive. Obviously that is going to be dependent on the indexing happening in the background. But it's still nice to have that feature built into the desktop there. For those coming off of things like TrueNAS Core, that's going to be quite a nice intuitive user friendly uh, service. Browse in that control panel. It does seem a little simple. I would have liked to have seen a kind of easy slash advanced switch here at the top. It's not bad, but it's just going through the options very, very quickly. You're able to see that the fundamentals are definitely being nailed down with SMB being enabled, but everything else from rsync to webdav to FTP and more all being disabled, which is probably what I want to see. Annoyingly, though, I did find that SSH was enabled by default. That said, this is a beta. It wouldn't surprise me if for troubleshooting that that was enabled by default, but disabled when it rolls out the gate. We'll have to wait and see. Everything within the control panel, we do go into way more detail on this when we go through the uh, software review. Um, is all pretty much there, everything that you want to see. And if we go through the hardware and the power, you've got the buzzer, you've got the fan control, you've got support of the um, scheduled uh, boot up and boot down, UPS support there. You've even got a really nice feature built into the LEDs where you can set a schedule for those bright white LEDs to be on and off on a schedule, not just the system, but also with the fans as well. Nice little systems, little quality of life improvements. Although I will say again, not to be a downer, but with the language, regardless of the fact how many times I selected English, occasionally Chinese notifications would come through. Again, it's a beta. When it comes to security on the system, I would say things still need a little bit of work. I'll say straight away that lack of two-factor authentication I mentioned earlier really bugs me. On top of that, although I've got network management and I can you know, adapt things from a static to a manual and set my own uh, configuration and controller as well as setting up remote access if needed using uh, the uh, Ugreen uh, relay service there, and the firewall options are there, the certificate, adding my own custom certificates, everything's there, auto-blocking IP for people overhitting it. The fact that um, updates are set as um, automatically install the updates by default, everything's there for me. But there's just a few little holes along the way that I don't really like that. For example, the security manager. Security manager is included with this system. As you can see, I'm using that real-time protection. And if I wish, I can run a quick scan if I choose. I can do a custom scan for certain databases and what to do if suspicious files are found. I can schedule a scan. I can find out the records of those scans, the logs, all of that. I can even, you know, put in preemptive measures. But what this doesn't do 
is filter through a list of system security because realistically viruses although people do hit NAS systems with viruses and malware that's not really the most popular form of attack NAS's face that is ransomware and for that I want a security manager that scans my system to tell me my passwords are weak my ports are open my ports are default and my two-factor authentication is off my I've enabled SSH when I don't need it those sort of things that prevent you know someone injecting a line of code encrypting my system and forcing me to you know blackmail me into giving a code that security manager seemingly protects me from malware and viruses but less so when it comes to you know injected um, uh, malicious code via attack vectors I know the log center is there to give me lots of information about what's going on on the system and I can set up automatic notifications based on severity for me to receive them and indeed when I go into the user management panel I can assign more contact information and be reached out in multiple ways to find out more about what's going on with the system and be alerted when things are going wrong. The security tab as mentioned does give you varying levels of protection from brute force attacks but I just wish there was a lot more there in terms of anti-ransomware protection. It's a beta. These things do take time. I get that. But I would have liked to have seen those fundamentally installed very early in this beta. Backup, synchronization and restoration on the system is pretty good, but still very much in development. What do I mean by that? Well, within the App Center, and again, there's only about 15 apps currently listed, some of which I would call default level apps. Um, sync and backup utility there is still kind of largely hinged on the utilization um, of taking advantage of that version manager there as well. So you've got a separate version manager uh, that got, runs through uh, individual folders that you've connected with use in sync and the backup manager there which allow you to sort of you know revert files back to an earlier version you can back up uh, files and folders from this nas onto another ugreen nas or another nas utilizing rsync with other features and other um, services being added soon there isn't really any synchronization with a cloud platform currently which kind of bums me out a little bit there whether it is for adding and mounting cloud storage or just adding it as a synchronized target in either direction from the NAS. The controls, they're a little bit rudimentary. Hopefully they will get expanded across upon, as I mentioned earlier on when we were talking about utilizing uh, the uh, client tool for when we were connecting with the NAS. I kind of wish this would be integrated in with something like Synology Drive or something uh, like uh, QNAP QSync from it allow me to create locally synchronized folders like these ones which will allow me to create synchronized areas of storage such as um, QSync or Synology Drive here using my native storage area but at least the building blocks are there we're still talking about a beta and likewise the system configuration can be backed up as well so for example whether you want to back up the system settings the user accounts and more those you can back up but you can only back them up cloud wise um, if you use their online Ugreen NAS account. Otherwise, you can do a localized backup if you choose. And again, you can restore a backup that you've created of those system settings, but remember that is not a full data-based file folder backup. That is where you will have to utilize um, that um, sync and backup tool we mentioned earlier on. Again, resetting network configuration, resetting system configuration, I think could stand to be presented a little bit more clearly. Again, it's a beta, blah, blah, blah. Overall, the UGOS software, I can see the fundamental building blocks there, but it still feels like a beta. And, you know, they're not hiding that. This is a beta. Everything is kind of need optimization in places. I think a lot of the applications and services are still very much in their version 0.5 state. A lot of it you can see where they're going, and I can definitely see why this brand is perhaps saying that this system is not going to be ready until much later in the year, whether it is for crowdfunding or just overall um, retail sale. I like what I'm seeing and I can see where they're going. I just hope they double down on things like security. They double down on things like anti-ransomware protection and certainly maybe improve upon, say, within the App Center, some of the third-party applications. Because right now, whether it is uh, absences of first-party applications like containers and virtual machine um, applications or even just multimedia tools beyond that at the likes of the DLNA Media app, for example, which is still very basic, which is going to be great for streaming locally to your client tools, but that's really about it. 
And for video management, I think if they're not going to go to the trouble of creating a premier first-party app, then start integrating those third-party services. Give me the option to add Plex, add MB. If I want to use things like Tailscale, give me the option to do so. And I think if that is something they add down the line, bravo to them. But if they don't, the serviceable level of applications right now, at least in this beta, are just a fractional app cluster. So now let's go into Putty and find out a little bit more about what's going on in the background of this system. Let's go ahead and list a lot of those components there and hopefully you can see that clear enough on screen. We've got the breakdown of all the storage, the different lanes. We've got our two NVMEs there in the base of the system along with the four drives. It's all laid out, you know, reasonably well there so let's um, maybe go down into just a wee bit more detail breaking that down in fact let's go in with sudo and really really get our teeth into what's going on here in the background here and now as mentioned those individual m2 nvmes are gen 4 times 4 we have got a drive here in the first slot there it's a e18 that's a gen 4 times 4 8tb drive we've got a seagate drive and an ad link 8TB Gen 4. And as you can see there, we've got our 4 times 4 We've got no limitation there, apparently. There's no downgrading. We've got that. And the same goes for when we go for our other bay that's got that uh, Fire Cuda 530 inside. Once again, we've got that 16 gig of transfers per second Gen 4 on a times 4 width. No downgrade, no limitation there whatsoever. Lovely stuff running there in the background. So let's do ourselves just a quick little test there in terms of performance. So first up, drive, um, SSD drive number one. So this is this drive down here. This is our uh, M.2 NVMe there. We can see that there on their own um, access there. Let's get the uh, task manager up as well so we can actually look at what's going on with this while we're accessing this drive. So let's go for that drive disk. Let's select our drive. We don't want to look at the hard drives. We want to see the M.2 NVMe's. It's not going to be giving us that. How super annoying. Okay, let's go in and just go ahead and run our operation and we're getting there 2.5 we got that seven gig as we spin up there those are some nice performance numbers i believe we are seeing here exactly what we wanted to see we saw a slowdown there initially and this isn't a cached input but we're getting seven gig which is or seven uh, six point seven these are very respectable numbers for that Gen 4 times 4 lane there. So at the very least, there's definitely no lies there in terms of what that drive is doing. But we're doing that right there for that single drive. But what about if we try and copy data from one drive to the other? So now we want to copy data from one M.2 NVMe to the other. That's right, we're going to be copying from here to here. One to an ATB, one is a 1TB, they're both Gen 4 SSDs. And what we want to see is, what kind of speed are we going to get? So let's go ahead and run this test between the two SSDs. We're seeing that initial uh, kind of drop there at the beginning. We're seeing that performance number go up. And we're seeing around two and a half. Now, whether that is that these two are sharing a lane while transferring the data between them is something we can debate. We're certainly seeing that performance number of seven gig on that initial drive, but still nonetheless transferring data from one SSD to the other would suggest that there is some sort of sharing there on that lane. Most users are not going to be using it that way. And if we go ahead and uh, utilize uh, the other NVMe on its own, the performance we're getting on drive number two on its own is still pretty darn good. So at the very least, we're seeing here that each of the individual drives when running, we're getting that true performance. When we were trying to transfer data between them, presumably because they are sharing some kind of lane as they both meet into the main system, we're seeing that dip. Nonetheless, knowing that we've got that seven gig for those drives is still great news as far as I'm concerned here. Next up, let's discuss 10 GBE performance on this device. And I'll tell you straight out the gate, it was middling right now. I've had numerous conversations with you, Green, in the background as they're re-optimizing over and over again in the software, they tell me. And in the three different versions of the software I tried, the numbers did get better, but still not the best. Connecting uh, to this device via a 10GBE switch, I was using a Sonic Solo 10G Thunderbolt adapter, running into a switch and then directly into the 10G slot. No other connections available. And with the RAID 5 array made up of uh, four, um, Ultra Star 10 TB drives, I was getting around about four to 500 megs on average in AJA with the performance testing, as I'm sure you can see on screen, which is okay. I'd say for the four drives not out of this world, I was kind of hoping for closer to 600 megs more regularly. 
But it was when I moved over to the M.2 NVMe testing, I had a single Seagate Viacuda 531TB and a volume occupying the whole space of that one drive. And over 10 GBE, I was still not getting much in excess of around 6 gigabit there. So again, around 600 megabytes per second there, which was less than I was hoping for. We're talking about an M2 NVMe here, which one we went in with uh, Putty over SSH was giving us a decent little number there, cracking out the six to seven gig. Whereas now over 10 GBE, it was still maxing at around five to 600 there. And again, whether it was AJA or when I was moving over to traditional read and write performance there with the Windows transfer, transferring over a big pile of data, I was still not getting numbers that I would personally like to see when I'm accessing a super fast NVMe over a 10 GBE connection. But nevertheless, that transfer there of that data carried over was still mm, still capping at around five to 600 megs. So there's still significant room for improvement on the 10 GBE on this system, sadly. Next up, let's discuss the mobile application available for iOS and Android. And I would say it's a pretty clean interface. As we make our way in, we can find the device there on the local area network. I've already saved the password. So we can just go in and log into the user interface there. Again, this, much like the other software, is in beta. We can find out more information about the operation of the system here. And it's kind of a rejigging of everything we've seen so far. We can kind of add and amend, add different features and services to this main um, hub that we can see via the mobile interface. We can go to our file management there and access all of the storage that we've got, be they the shared folders or the personal folders. We can go ahead and again, I am accessing this on the local area network. So we've got all of the usual information we saw before. Not too shabby and it is being very responsive. And that's kind of what you want from a mobile application, especially when you're dealing with a network interface. Um, again, Pretty much everything we're seeing here is we're just seeing a rearrangement of what the desktop application was showing us. What I quite like is they've managed to boil down the majority of those application services into a single GUI here. Rather than having separate applications for file management, separate applications for system management and shares, they've tried to roll it all into one. It can seem a little bit intense, may seem like a lot of information is being thrown our way. There's our different gateways that we're trying to access here on the network interface simultaneously. If we choose, we could go in and find out more about our hardware, everything we've seen thus far just presented in this mobile form. And it may seem like a lot of information, but in a weird way, it's kind of what I was looking for in the control panel earlier on. It's more information being displayed to us in a far more informative manner. But again, I appreciate this may seem a touch more intimidating uh, for a novice users, but at least you've got all of this information anyway at your fingertips there. Uh, cycling along, as you may have already noticed, we've got access to the App Center, so we can choose to install individual applications and services if we hadn't already installed them. And even if we choose to, we could go ahead and uninstall them if we like at the simple click of a button. There's a whole range of control here. And let's see what happens when we go into the user management control. So here's our standard user here, the user that I'm pretty much doing most of this video with but we can go ahead and create a brand new user on the fly via that mobile application pretty smoothly pretty easily and although we've already discussed at length the network and security protocol here and what i liked and what i didn't like at least at the very least i'm able to see a lot of these things double check change some of those blocking rules if need be on the fly now, what about phone backing up? That's the other reason why a lot of you are going to go ahead and install an application like this on your mobile. Well, there's different ways and means here. If we make our way to the bottom left there into the sync and backup, we can see my Google Pixel 6 Pro here, and we can choose if we wish to start backing up our photos. If we choose going in there, we can find out um, while giving the application permission, we can choose where exactly we want the photos to be backed up onto the system into their own preset directory in the personal folder or select custom folders if we choose. But keep in mind that by doing that, if you go into the wrong folders and we change some of those paths outside of the personal folder, and I'm not entirely certain you can, you're not going to be able to access it on that photos application as discussed earlier on. Again, there's sorting. There's the usual stuff you'd like to see whether you want to back up on Wi-Fi or not. It is presented very, very straightforwardly. I'm not going to say that they're breaking the mold here, but at the very least, they have kept it very straightforward and easy. And the same goes for if you go into the network settings there uh, on the application itself, by going into the general settings, you can find out just straight away whether you want to back up on Wi-Fi only on its own, notwithstanding that synchronization there for photography. And if we go into the photo application here for when we do have 
our photos backed up onto the device as you can see there there is our backup area there that's built into the mobile backup and that means that folder is now going to be accessible on the desktop now whether we can extend this to normal storage outside of photos that's going to be a very different story there is our arrangement of folders there and we can if we choose connect to a network folder or create a new shared folder on the NAS but how much of this is being conducted locally well Unfortunately, it seems at launch you're not able to automatically upload data from your phone outside of the photo and multimedia folders. But you can, of course, action those uploads manually. So, for example, there's our test share folder there. Click the plus symbol and from there, you're able to see that we can create a new folder, upload a new photo, upload a new video, upload music or upload a document. So we could upload a document and there is all of our information from earlier. Likewise, we could go and if we choose, upload a photo and it goes through our catalogue of photos very easily. We can upload those directly. Again, it's nice to have, but I kind of wish I could have got a scheduled backup just like I could with the synchronization and backup option we can see here with regards to photos. And hopefully that is something that will be scaled up later on. And for those that are going to be utilizing their NAS for managing, uh, you know, multi-seeded downloads, again, keep it legal, guys. You can synchronize with the download application there and choose to, if you wish, directly send links from your mobile phone onto the NAS, be it via a link uh, from a seeded file you've already got, or you can just use the camera on your phone to take a photo of a barcode and scan it there. So the options are pretty good. And the mobile application, I will say, although it's not perfect, I'd say it is a very functional tool. And one thing I will highlight, which you may have noticed by now, it is exceedingly responsive. So what do I think? Well, I've had this device for about three weeks and I've come to two pretty big conclusions about it. Number one, it's not finished. They never pretended it was finished. They told me it was in progress. It's a prototype, the software is beta. Caveat, 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 caveat. I get it. This is not a finished product and it definitely feels that way. Sturdy build quality wise, 100% I think it's done. But in terms of the software, in terms of the optimization, in terms of the performance, in terms of making those next level improvements to a product, it's not there yet. It definitely exists. It's a legit product. And although their marketing material may seem a little bit shiny, a little bit snazzy, I would say they are on the road to achieving a lot of the things that they say. But it definitely, definitely, definitely isn't there yet. The other thing I've reached as a conclusion this thing shouldn't be a crowdfunded product. The fact that they're pursuing crowdfunding with this, I get it, they're testing the war, they're seeing what the market's like, seeing whether it's a solution that people want, I get all of that, but at the same time, I would much, 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 much rather they kept this in development for another six, maybe eight to 12 months, perfect it and make it retail, because I think a product like this could actually do well. I also think, and again, this harks back to a and a we did a few, uh, I think about a week ago here on the channel, trying to get the dates lined up in my head, when they were talking about third-party OS support on this. I think they are making a mistake when it comes to saying no use of third-party OS, because their OS, although it's got the fundamentals seemingly nailed down, most users are going to look at this and want to use your Unraid, want to use your TrueNAS. And for that, as a pre-built solution to use your operating system of choice, that this will be a great solution. And I really, really hope that Ugreen reverse that decision in terms of hardware support, uh, in terms of warranty, if people go down that third-party OS route. Ultimately, I do think this is a good product, but it needs more time in the oven. It needs to be finished. In the background of evaluating and bench testing this product, I've been talking to other YouTube reviewers, other reviewers that have received this device, either for their own personal testing and their own reviews of this prototype coming up, or just generally been invited into the evaluation program for this. And we're all kind of a consistent frame of mind. This is a good product in theory, but it's not done yet. Everything from SMB over map drive just not being as stable as we would like to see at this time. Uh, the, the fact that that 10GB is just not hitting full saturation in a way that we would expect because we've been reviewing completed products and we have to dial it down to a pre you know development between alpha and beta mindset for this and you're going to see that a lot in reviews be they written or video in the next few weeks as this starts to unveil itself on that crowdfunding platform right now as long as you're going to continue with that 
um, roadmap with that feature update um, map and definitely, definitely, definitely continue with that optimization between updates. I think this can become a contender, but it's only if they commit to that because right now, I can still taste the dough in the pastry. I can still see it needing more time in that oven. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this. We're going to be doing a full deep dive into the software as well. And we are going to be looking into using third-party OS, something that's already been explored online. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. We'll come back to this when we know the software has become a little bit more established. And we do have the hardware review of the DXP480T flash model coming as well. So stay tuned for that. But apart from that, Thank you so much for watching. There's links in the description to other written guides on the hardware and the software of this device. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Have a great weekend, guys.